Today, we are joined for a candid conversation about disability and accessibility for tourism operators. This webinar will address topics such as the impacts of enhancing ac accessibility in your business and tips and tricks to making your business more accessible. Today, we're joined by Lisa Franks. Lisa was born and raised in Moose Jaw. Growing up, she loved sports and at the age of 14 had a cluster of blood vessels burst in her spinal cord and left her paralyzed from the neck down. She slowly regained the use of her arms and began to adapt her new life using a wheelchair. She discovered wheelchair sports and quickly rose through the ranks of competition. She has competed at three Paralympic Games in wheelchair racing and wheelchair basketball, winning six gold medals and one silver. Throughout her racing career, she has set seven world records in distance from 100 meters to 42 kilometer marathon. Lisa graduated from the University of Saskatchewan with a degree in mechanical engineering and completed the Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility Certification Program. On any given day, you can find Lisa surfing on the West Coast, exploring the mountain bike trails in Saskatchewan, and traveling in her wheelchair in an accessible camper van. Welcome, Lisa. Oh, thank you. And I'm so glad uh, we can connect here today. So I'm just going to start sharing my screen here and get the presentation going. Welcome everybody. I am so glad you could tune in and join me today as we talk about accessibility and tourism and what happens when those worlds collide. My name is Lisa Franks and my pronouns are she, her, and today I will be giving you my insights on a way to make travel experiences accessible and inclusive. My slides have a white background with green accents on them and the text is in black. The lower right hand corner has a small image of myself talking. I'm a white female with long hair that goes past my shoulders and it's brown in color. I'm wearing a maroon top and behind me the background is my camper van which has pine accents uh, on the ceiling and on the windows. The next slide is titled Agenda. And on it, it has a picture of me giving a thumbs up sign as I'm on a hiking trail. And it also has an image of a wheelchair sign with an arrow pointing the direction of which way is the accessible trail. And the agenda today, first of all, I'm going to introduce myself and who I am. We're going to talk about why accessibility is important. I'm going to talk about one of the first things you can do with accessibility, and that is interaction with people. And then I'm going to go into how you can re redefine how you think about accessibility. I'm going to give some examples of easy wins on making your business accessible, and then more tips and tricks. I'll talk about the Rick Hansen Foundation Accessibility uh, Certification. Then we'll go through some examples of good and bad accessibility, things that I've encountered, and finally we'll wrap up with a question and answer period. So who is Lisa Franks? Well, uh, probably one of the first things people would notice about me is that I do use a wheelchair to get around. When I was 14 years old, I had a cluster of blood vessels burst in my spine. That actually caused me to be a quadriplegic. I lost all movement in my arms and legs, but I slowly regained use in my hands and arms. And now I wheel myself around in a manual wheelchair. So I have 28 years of lived ex experience with a disability. I'm a Paralympic athlete. I competed in three Paralympic games in two different sports, one being wheelchair racing and then wheelchair basketball. And I brought Canada home a few medals from those Paralympic Games. I'm an honorary colonel in the Air Force, uh, actually the honorary colonel of 15 Wing Moose Jaw. Uh, I was born and raised and still call Saskatchewan home. 
and I'm also a mechanical engineer after studying at the University of Saskatchewan. Probably the title I identify with the most is adventurer and outdoor enthusiast. I'm the founder of the Saskatchewan Adaptive Mountain Bike Club, which takes people with disabilities out on trails on a special adaptive mountain bike. And with that, I've actually worked with the Trans Canada Trail for the past three years on helping them improve accessibility in the outdoors. And I'm also a van lifer. I live for most of the year in my uh, self-converted wheelchair accessible camper van. So right now I'm actually avoiding the cold temperatures of Saskatchewan and I'm in California uh, where I spend a good amount of my winters. The next slide is titled Stuff I Do and I really felt it was important to include this because I often find that people's perceptions or expectations of a person with a disability or who uses a wheelchair like me are actually very, very low. And I wanted to showcase some of the things that I'm capable of doing. So the first picture in the upper left hand corner shows me at the Great Wall of China. Uh, I've been to China a few times and overall I've traveled to over 25 countries in my lifetime. So I've seen all different levels of, of accessibility throughout the entire world. A picture in the middle shows me surfing. So I'm an adaptive surfer with Team Canada and I spend a lot of my winters training. Uh, right now I'm in California uh, getting ready for a big upcoming year. The picture in the upper right hand corner shows me skiing. Uh, I grew up skiing able-bodied and it was a big void that was missing in my life. So uh, several years ago I was able to finally learn how to mono ski. Uh, it's just one little ski and two poles uh, are my arms that help me steer and stay upright. The picture on the lower left hand side shows myself sitting outside of my camper van with one of my adaptive mountain bikes that I own for the adaptive mountain club that I run. And the lower right picture is me competing at a downhill mountain bike race called the Sea Otter Classic. And I'm sitting on a bike that is very aggressive looking and I've got a bright ye yellow helmet on with a, a chin guard. The next slide is titled Why Accessibility Matters. And the subtitle below it says it's the right thing to do. I'm showing a picture of myself as a toddler and I'm standing in front of a globe and it's really just to symbolize that I was ready to explore the world and see everything that it had to offer. I have another picture of myself as a teenager. I'm out enjoying the outdoors with a downhill ski team and I'm just not having any boundaries whatsoever in my life. We are very outdoorsy family. It was a big part of my lifestyle growing up. And the third picture is just a few months after that second picture uh, where I'm now paralyzed and I'm completely uh, dependent on other people around me. And I was also told that, uh, th I was in grade 8, I was told that the high school I was planning on going to in a few months for grade 9 was not wheelchair accessible. And so I'm going through this major transition in my life, the hardest time in my life. And now I have to go to a different high school. I'm away from all of my friends and high school is hard enough. So could you imagine how that felt when I was told that the world I had laid out ahead of me uh, was no longer in the plans. And so disability is the only minority group that anyone can become a part of at any time in their life. Could you imagine just waking up tomorrow and you don't even have access to your own home? You can't be involved in your passions, your job, or even possibly access to your own business. The next slide is again titled Why Accessibility Matters. And I go on to write that one in five Canadian adults has one or more disabilities. And this number is even projected to increase significantly with our aging demographic. Now, if you think about it, that is a large percentage. That's 20% 20 of uh, clientele that your business 
could be excluding if it is not accessible. Uh, if you make your business accessible, you're just creating a larger customer base and employee base. Don't forget that uh, anybody that wants to be employed by you might also require accommodations. Improving accessibility brings about increased quality of life. It creates more independence and better social integration. Basically, we build a better community when everyone can be involved. I know when I first started using a wheelchair, I was overwhelmed just thinking about how inaccessible the world is and how I would feel so left out. And that had a major impact uh, on my mental health I went through some depression and anxiety right off the start because I just felt like I would never really be fully included in society and didn't know if I could offer much to society because it seemed so inaccessible but luckily things have improved over the past 28 years and uh, it's become more of an issue uh, within the built environment to make inclusion So designing for one group can also result in solutions that address the needs of many others. And we call that universal design. And that really places human diversity at the heart of the design process so that buildings and environments can be designed to meet the needs of all users. It creates an environment that can be used by any person regardless of their age, their size, their disability, or ability. So one example of universal design is having a level entry or a ramped entry into a building uh, versus a staircase. Not only does that help me as a wheelchair user, it would also help somebody who was say pushing a stroller or carrying groceries in a shopping cart or a wagon. Um, it really just takes the barrier out and it increases um, the usage for everybody and just makes life easier for everybody, which is why it's called universal design. And it's also, uh, you know, important to note that the Saskatchewan Human Rights has a very, very wordy section, section 12, that basically says that nobody can be desi uh, denied or discriminated in accommodation or service or a facility uh, if it's customarily allowed and offered to the public. Now that we have talked about why it's important to include people with disabilities, let's talk a little bit about how we can help to make them feel included and more comfortable. And that actually begins with interaction. So first things first, just be cool. <laughs> talk to a person with a disability just like they're a regular average person, because we are. I know sometimes people get very nervous and they don't want to say the wrong thing around me, but really, I just want to be treated like I'm any other person. And do not assume anything. It's really impossible to tell at first glance what someone's situation is. So please don't make assumptions on what they can or cannot do or what their disability is just by looking at them. And on that note, always speak to the person with the disability, not their companion. I can't tell you how many times I've gone, like, say, to a restaurant and asked for a reservation. And instead of addressing me, uh, the hostess would look at whoever I'm with. And it just feels uh, really degrading. And it's as if I'm not seen or I'm not ag being acknowledged as an independent person. And trust the person with the disability to voice their needs. We have to learn how to speak up if we do have needs, um, but oftentimes we don't and we might not have anything to say. And so that's okay too. <laughs> and if you absolutely feel like you want to offer assistance, uh, a good way to word that is to say, you know, let me know if I can lend you a hand. That way it's a neutral offer that's saying you're available if you need me, but there's a pretty good chance you might not need me. So that's cool too. Well, now that we're comfortable talking to people with disabilities, how do we want to be addressed? And 
basic terminology, we actually want to avoid the term handicapped. It's a very dated term that actually goes back to the phrase cap in hand because way back in the olden days, if you had a disability, uh, you were likely begging on the streets. And so we're trying to get away from that term. Avoid other demeaning words like suffers from or is wheelchair bound or confined. The fact is my wheelchair actually doesn't confine me. I'm not bound to it. It's an amazing device that gives me independence and freedom to explore the world. And we want to use person first language. So a person with a disability or a person who uses a wheelchair. On the left, I have a little graphic that shows some incorrect terms and uh, a more appropriate term. So calling someone handicapped or disabled people. Again, we want to use people first language and say people with disabilities. Uh, or somebody wouldn't be addressed as a midget or a, a dwarf. Uh, it'd be a person of short stature. Um, the handicapped parking or bathroom, call it the accessible parking or the accessible bathroom. And the blind or suffers from vision loss, more appropriate would be a person who is blind or visually impaired. So the next slide is titled, Redefine How You Think About Accessibility. And the subtitle is, Accessibility is on a Spectrum. It's less of a yes, no state and more of a spectrum. So what works for me might not actually work for other wheelchair users and vice versa. We all have different capabilities and it's really hard to just give a blanket accessibility uh, status to something. Many places think that they are not accessible, but in reality, they're actually very, very close. The definition of fully accessible can seem so daunting that places don't even try. And when in reality, just with a little bit of effort, they could make their business so much more welcoming to many people. So instead of thinking we are not accessible, look around and see what is. You'll probably be very surprised. So we're going to look at a few easy wins that you might be able to incorporate with your business. First of all, look for those quick fixes. So in this picture, um, there's one step into the store um, and that's just a huge barrier. I wouldn't be able to access that business because of one singular step, uh, but there's a place, uh, an organization called Stopgap who actually makes these little ramps. Uh, they're very portable. They can be set up during business hours and moved uh, when the business is closed uh, and they're all custom built based on the, the height of the step. And so it's a very easy solution and just to take away that barrier because one step can be such a big thing for people to overcome, uh, but the solution can be actually very easy and very affordable. And installing a grab bar in the bathroom. You could go to Home Depot and pick one of those up. So uh, that's just another feature that ensures that there is accessibility thought of and safety for a person that might need a little bit of extra support uh, when using the washrooms. Now here's another one, a big one, is to actually make your bathroom accessible. Oftentimes the door will swing into the bathroom and then when I wheel my wheelchair in, I'm not able to close the door because now my wheelchair is blocking it. So a very easy fix is to actually flip the swing of the door so that instead of opening inwards into the space of the bathroom, it now opens outwards and there's enough room to be able to uh, shut the door behind me. Okay, so another easy win, and this is probably the most important thing that I could talk about. And if you take one thing away from today's presentation, it should be this. And that is to provide accessibility information on your website, in your emails, on your event pages, 
or flyers. Put something, just put anything that shows that you have thought about access, even for a brief moment. A note even saying that this venue is not wheelchair accessible tells me more than saying nothing. You wouldn't believe how much time I actually spend on Google Maps, Street View. Uh, If I plan on going to a restaurant or a concert, uh, I actually have to do a lot of planning ahead to make sure I can get parking nearby or an accessible entrance. Um, But if the business or event planner has already done that for me, uh, it just makes me feel more welcome and more inclined to go participate or visit that business. And if you have a business that has a facility somewhere on that website of your business, you should have a dedicated tab or a dedicated page that describes your particular access. So it can be broken down into many things, but you could start with a parking or a drop off area. Where are the accessible stalls relative to the front entrance? And how are you going to enter the building? Are there stairs? If so, how many? Is there a ramp? Is there a secret accessible entrance that I have to go through a back alley and somehow get on the phone and call the building manager? Tell us this. And yes, this has happened on several occasions. And if you can see the access from the front door to me, that means it's not accessible and I won't even uh, be able to enter the, the building because I won't know if there is an accessible entrance. Are there automatic door openers? Some people that use a power wheelchair or a scooter might need that. And if there aren't any available, is there a number that you can call for assistance? Also describe the washrooms. Do you have washrooms on the premises? Are they accessible? And if you're a really large facility, are there accessible washrooms in multiple locations? Is the only accessible washroom reachable by a locked elevator that you need to track down a key for from a specific person in a specific location in a very busy building? Tell us that. And again, yes, that has happened to me on many occasions. Seating areas. Do you have low tables that a wheelchair user can use? Uh, Those high tables at bars and restaurants have become very popular lately and guess what? They're not very accessible and it's uh, very, very frustrating when you go to a restaurant and that is the only option or maybe there is one lowered table but it's already occupied by somebody else. Do you have a high table that could be lowered? And do you have a particular area that works for people with service dogs or strollers and just has a little bit of extra room nearby? And if you're a very large tourist attraction, do you have seating throughout your venue? And then you can also include information about your, the surfaces. If your venue has outdoor spaces, describe that. Uh, is it paved? Is it compact gravel? Is it grass? Is it loose gravel? Is it packed snow or fully cleared snow that is done every day? Believe it or not, all of those different options might change my mind on whether I go to the venue or even I might bring different tools with me. I have different attachments that can go on my wheelchair. So some could help me get through that gravel or that snow. And I might opt to bring that, but if I don't know what the circumstances of getting around the venue or into the building is like, I wouldn't know what to bring. And are the surfaces lit? Of course, this helps for everybody for safety and is really crucial for somebody with a visual impairment. This next slide is going to talk about hotel rooms or anything that offers accommodations and you really want to describe the features of your accessible rooms and ideally have a lot of pictures. All of this information will allow a person to decide for themselves if it will work for them or not. So I stay in hotels and campgrounds um, all of the time and 
every time I visit one, the accessible room is very different. I really couldn't tell you what it's going to look like until I show up. Include things in your description like the bed height. Some hotel beds are very high and very difficult to get into from my wheelchair. Pictures of the washroom and a very detailed description. Again, we want to know if the door swings in to the bathroom, is there enough room for me to be able to maneuver with my wheelchair or somebody with a walker? And we want to know what the bathtub or the shower situation is. It a bathtub that I'm going to have to use all my strength to get in and out of, or is it a shower uh, that might include a bench that I could transfer out of my wheelchair onto? The width of the doorway into the bathroom is also very important information. Some people have larger wheelchairs and some people have small tiny chairs that can fit through a standard door. But I want to know before I show up what the situa situation is going to be like. And also list any mobility equipment that's available. So I talked about a roll-in shower that might have a bench uh, or a lift even or sliding boards and again this information is power. It allows me to decide if the bathroom or the hotel room will work for me. And maybe I might need to bring some specialized equipment to make it more comfortable for myself. We're now going to move into a section called tips and tricks and ways to be more inclusive. So this is going beyond just the quick, easy things you could do, um, but they're still pretty important. And one of these is including your image and video descriptions on your social media posts. A brief written description of what a picture is showing or what the visual elements of your post is about so that everyone can understand the information being shared. You might have actually noticed during my presentation, um, I at my first slide, I described my appearance, appearance and I described the layout of my slides and as I've been going through I've been giving um, an audio description of pictures that I'm showing and that is because somebody with a visual impairment might be part of this uh, presentation and I want to make sure that I'm able to relay all the information that is there visually so that they can also be aware of it as well. Now another way to uh, be more inclusive is to partner with local organizations that might op offer adaptive equipment rental or experiences. So an example of this is the Whistler Adapt Adaptive Sports Program has actually partnered with the Peak to Peak Gondola. So in Whistler, if I can go and I can visit the Adaptive Sports Program, they can share with me some of the experiences that I can also do in Whistler and one of those is the peak to peak gondola that I can ride and they've worked together to show or to make the experience more accessible for people with disabilities. And the Whistler Adaptive had given a helping hand on showing them ways to be more inclusive with that. If your business is partially access accessible, consider offering uh, a discount for patrons with a disability. For example, uh, I do a lot of traveling uh, around campgrounds and parks and both California, BC, I believe Oregon as well are just a few examples of places that actually offer 50% off camping. And that's just because they recognize that I'm not able to go access all of their beaches, all of their trails. Uh, I might not get the full immersive experience of visiting uh, their park or their campground and so they're recognizing that and just giving me a little bit of a break on the price of admission. And now this is yet another very important uh, piece of advice is to have somebody with lived experience come out and actually like give a trial of your business or the experience that you're offering. Uh, there's so many things that you only recognize uh, about this world or about accessibility when you've lived it. Simple things like uh, the swing of the door. I'm sure many people might not have thought of that, 
but if you've lived it for a lot of your life, you'll be able to help. And an example of this is actually this past summer, I helped out a, a new business that was offering uh, paddleboard experiences and I was able to go work with her and we figured out ways to get from the parking lot to the waterside and how she actually bought beach mats so I could get across the sand. She had a special attachment uh, for her paddleboard that made it more stable for me and actually had back support and I worked with her to show how um, I could need some assistance getting on and off the paddleboard and it was great and now she's able to offer that to more people as her business experience. And another tip is to implement accessibility right from the start. This will save you so much time and so much money and a lot of frustration. If you're thinking of it right from the get-go, you can plan your business around that instead of trying to have to backtrack and say, oh, how do we make something we've already built or already planned now work? And we might have to go and retrofit and rip things apart to make them accessible. If you plan for it and make it a goal and a priority right from the beginning, you're gonna make your lives a whole lot easier. And on top of that, hire a professional to assess your built environment. Would you go and build a building with uh, out hiring an electrician or a plumber to do those specialty things? No, of course not. You would never even consider it. So if you really want to make your business or your experience more inclusive, absolutely you need somebody that has that experience and can point you in the right direction and it will make a world of difference for the patrons that do visit your business because they'll be able to recognize the effort that was put into it. So on that note of hiring a professional, there is a certification that the Rick Hansen Foundation has come up with and this is truly the golden standard within accessibility in the industry. Um, so they've worked to develop this program to help improve accessibility of the built environment and that is for places where we live, work, learn and play. So there is a large gap between what people need to be fully productive in society and what the building code compliance is. Uh, oftentimes the building code is just bare minimum, um, but it doesn't really give somebody the full independence to be able to use a facility or, or a building or a, a built environment. And so the disabilities that the Rick Hansen Foundation designs for include mobility, visual, cognitive, hearing loss, and neurodivergent. And that's that last part there, neurodivergent, really, you don't see any consideration for that in the building code. And so that's really what makes uh, the Rick Hansen Foundation certification uh, so much better than just the standard uh, building codes. And so what happens is you would go, you would hire uh, a professional to come audit your building or your built environment. And then you'll get a detailed assessment of the current status of your building um, and it'll give you a roadmap to bridge any gaps within the accessibility. And you can even start this process before anything is built. Uh, we could look over your, your building plans and catch things before uh, it's even built in physical space. And so there's three uh, outcomes that could come from this. Uh, wh number one, you could just not be certified at all. You could be considered certified or gold certified. And uh, if anyone is familiar with the LEED building, which is talking about environmental impact uh, that a building would have, it's very similar to that, but just with the accessibility. And so to be certified um, or gold certified, you have to meet certain minimum standards. And those are more like the building codes. So it's like, okay, yes, can is there a level entry into the building? And so you have to be able to meet those baseline things to even become certified. 
And then if you go above and beyond and reach 80% of the total accessibility criteria, you can then become gold certified. Now I have taken this course and I will say as somebody who's lived uh, with uh, a disability for so long, uh, it was really eye-opening because the, the certification just thought of every little detail and just uh, really added value to be able to get around these buildings that um, most people um, just wouldn't even consider. And so it's, it's highly, highly worth it. I'm now going to move into some of the examples of things that I have talked about. Uh, so I am showing a picture here of a self-registration station at a provincial campground I showed up at. And this is where you just go and you write down your site number that you're going to stay at and you pay all uh, at that station. And this is the very first, you know, welcome to the campground. And there's a big step to get up to uh, this area as well as even if I was able to get up there, the writing desk is very high and so I was unable to uh, use that properly. So I did actually have to get out of my wheelchair uh, and I crawled up onto this platform and then pulled my wheelchair up and got back into my wheelchair. And it was not an easy task and that really set the tone for my week. Um, I was supposed to spend five days there at that campground and uh, I just was in a bit of a bad mood seeing this and then seeing other things around the campground that were just inaccessible and just absolutely fails. And so I only ended up spending one night there and I tried to move on to find something that would uh, make me feel more thought of and welcomed. Another trip I did back in 2017 was in Oregon and a friend and I were going to go from Portland to the coast in a place called Cannon Beach, which is an iconic place that has these beautiful rock formations uh, just on the coast of the ocean. And when she had been there before my friend, but when we arrived, we could not seem to find a place to access the beach that wasn't full of stairs. Everywhere we looked there were stairs and we even tried googling an accessible access point to Cannon Beach and couldn't. we came up with zero, nothing. We couldn't find any information and uh, I didn't want to miss out on the beautiful experience and sharing it with my friend. I didn't want to hold her back or um, you know just have her go on her own quickly and to see it and feel bad for me leaving me behind. So I made the decision to actually get out of my wheelchair and crawl down two flights of stairs while my friend carried my wheelchair for me. So it was a tedious thing and actually a bit of a safety thing because uh, I could easily have scraped up my, my lower limbs and not have noticed it because I, I don't have feeling. But it worked out in the end. I did get to see this beautiful location and share it with my friend, but it didn't have to be that difficult. And when we were actually down there on the beach, we could now see that there was a level and a ramped entry down to the sightseeing area. And so we were able to exit that way, but we didn't know it was there. And it's all because there was no information available and we didn't happen to be at that spot uh, when we pulled in. So we had no idea. So again, providing information just would make me have uh, the ability to avoid that whole uh, scenario of having to get out of my comfort zone and crawl down two flights of stairs. Now here's an example of the California State Park website. So if I want to go camping at a specific park, uh, I would go to the information page for, for that park and it, when you scroll down, you see there's information like directions on how to get there, the hours, and they actually have this special tab that says accessible features. And when you click on that, you can scroll through and it gives so much information, um, even from the campground, uh, what to expect as far as 
getting around the campground or which sites are accessible. It describes the picnic area and even gives me information on the trails that connect the campground. So I have all this information at my fingertips and that can allow me to decide whether that park is going to be a good experience for me to visit or not. And it's funny because I actually stumbled across this California website back in 2017 when I was looking for a place to go camping. And now I have gone back to California every year since then, just because I know that uh, there's information available. And so that you can never underestimate the value of pro providing information like that to help somebody steer their course in their travel destination. Another great example of an organization that has put a lot of thought and effort into inclusion and accessibility is the San Diego Zoo, which is a massive, massive facility. And right on their website, they have a dedicated area for guests with disabilities. And they even have a link here for a accessibility guide. And when I click on that, they have a 13 page guide that uh, has all the information you would need from uh, parking to getting access to an electric scooter, uh, what their policy is on service animals, all the services that they offer and it's all there at my fingertips and it just makes planning a trip so much easier. This next example is uh, an example of an organization that went above and beyond. And this is outdoor uh, river rafting in Kananaskis. And many people would think that that would not be an accessible excursion, but they were equipped when I, I phoned because my friends were going and I didn't know if I'd be able to join them. And they assured me that yes, they've had people with disabilities before and they were quite prepared uh, to help me get out on this excursion. So it was a bit of a rough terrain to get down to where we got uh, onto the rafts, but they had staff that was trained on how to roll my wheelchair down this very uneven pathway. And then they had a vehicle that picked up my wheelchair and drove it to the final destination where the raft was at the, at the end of the day. So. Uh, I was able to just sit in this back left corner and enjoy the experience along with my friends and I felt so included and so thought of and just really grateful that they had thought outside of the box to allow me to participate in something that I really didn't know if it would be possible or not. I've traveled to Whistler a few times and they did a really great job of accessibility in that area uh, with uh, the help of the Olympics and the Paralympics being held in that area. They really wanted to be uh, inclusive and so I was able to actually visit Superfly Zipline which again is a very rugged uh, experience that I didn't know uh, I would ever be able to do. But when I called, the staff was fully prepared. They told me that there were only two of the, I think, three or four zip lines that were accessible, but that they wanted uh, me to come and that they were more than happy to accommodate my needs. And when I showed up, uh, I was basically told that instead of having to hike to the top of the zip lines, they provided an ATV or a side by side ride for me to get to uh, the first zip line and you can see my wheelchair is in the back there. So what they did was once we got to the top of the zip line, they um, carried me up the stairs to the platform and I was able to just go on the harness just like everybody else. They had to lift me up, but I was able to have this incredible experience and they were actually fully prepared. By the time I got to the bottom of the zip line, they had taken the AV ATV with my wheelchair to the bottom so that I was met with that. Uh, and it really worked out incredibly seamless and I would definitely go back again. This is an example of what we call a wheel-in shower and it's uh, basically designed for 
for able-bodied people, but also people with mobility issues, such as a wheelchair or a walker. And this was uh, installed at uh, the airbase where I'm an honorary colonel. They, they actually made a suite uh, within the airbase accessible for me. And so I'm just gonna give you a minute or two to, to look at it and observe, and I want you to see how well uh, they think, you think they did uh, are in designing this. So at first glance, um, it looks pretty good. It's got a grab bar here. It's got a bench so that I can transfer out of my wheelchair and I won't get my own personal wheelchair soaking wet. Uh, it does have a curtain here that I can close so that my wheelchair again doesn't get soaking wet. And it's got some shelves and another little grab bar here. Uh, but the one big mistake they made with this and this is very common is that they made the, the shower head and the controls too far away. So I can, this shower head does come down. It doesn't show it in the picture. It does come down, come down and it's portable. But if I'm sitting on this bench, I don't have any way to control the flow of the water or the temperature. So this is just a small example that I wanted to show of you know, these designers, these builders thought they were doing a great thing. They thought they checked all the boxes uh, of what made a shower accessible, but they actually didn't think about the function of it and how it would work for somebody with uh, a mobility challenge like myself. So I'm able to use it, but uh, I have to make sure that this handheld shower is over here and I kind of stick it uh, so that it's like in that grab bar so I can reach it once I'm on it and then I have to even start the water flowing and hope I've guessed at the proper temperature before I transfer onto that bench so it's not ideal and just a really good example of why hiring somebody uh, that knows these kinds of things is very important. Here is a much better setup of a wheel-in shower. It's again got lots of grab bars, but this time the shower head and the controls are reachable from the actual bench that I would be sitting on. And I don't know what is more frustrating when a shower or a feature is completely inaccessible or like in the last slide where they've tried to make it accessible and completely missed the mark. Uh, I think it's a bit of a toss-up between the two of them, or which irritates me more. So to wrap this up, I want to give a little summary of the top things that I would love if you could remember and take away from today. And number one is to look for those easy wins, like eliminating that one step that is a barrier, or include descriptions on your website, and um, you will be surprised at how those little things will just open up your business to so many more people. And do not assume that your business or experience cannot be made accessible. Look at the examples I gave of zip lining and river rafting. They made it possible, you can too. Just because I use a wheelchair doesn't mean that my love of the outdoors or those rugged experiences went away. I still long to do those things and when I feel included and can see that those things are possible, uh, it just really um, makes everything so much better. Hire a professional or at the very least somebody with lived experience that can review your business. There will be little things that you may have overlooked even if you think you've done the best job at accessibility uh, that somebody might be able to pick up on that. If you don't have that background, you may have missed. And providing inclusion and access is the right thing to do. I want to be as included in things. And again, the minority of a disability, anyone could become part of that group at any time. And uh, we really want to uh, focus on making sure that if something does happen that your business is uh, inviting for everybody. So with that uh, you can email me any questions 
or you could even follow along in my adventures uh, with Instagram or YouTube. I really like to showcase some of the things that I'm able to do because it really opens people's minds up and bends their perceptions of what a person with a disability is capable of. So feel free to follow along on uh, any of those channels. And uh, now I guess we'll open it up for any questions that you might have for me. Perfect. Well, anyone, if anyone does have any questions, uh, again, feel free to use the question and answer uh, function and we can ask Lisa. Um, so one question that's popped up, I work on programs that include a portion of hiking in naturalized areas. What can we do to encourage accessibility? Yes, that's a wonderful question and something I am very passionate about. So uh, I have actually been working with Trans Canada Trail, which I mentioned, and we're uh, basically going trail by trail throughout their network. And uh, they've made it, um, you know, high priority to have somebody with a lived dis disability go out and actually go on the trails, assess them, see what improvements can be made, or if a trail could even be possible to be made accessible. And so, with that, there's always um a meeting of is the natural or trail environment accessible and the equipment that is now available. So there are now off-road wheelchairs, there's adaptive mountain bikes that can also go on hiking trails, and it's all a matter of having those two meet in the middle. And so once um, a trail can be assessed by somebody, then they could probably provide whether, you know, any wheelchair could go on this trail or uh, some specialized equipment like um, a free will, which is an attachment I use on my wheelchair. Or I even have a motorized attachment that can go on some natural trails or if you even want to be more aggressive, um, an adaptive mountain bike to go on that trail. So partnering with something like uh, my uh, out outdoor place, like I don't want to promote myself, but the adaptive mountain bike club could do that or uh, just having some the first step for sure is assessing the trail and seeing uh, what is available right now and if improvements could be made and so uh, if you know anybody that uh, can come and do that or I'm always happy to also offer my services to you but um, and then the next part would be promoting and making sure that people know what is possible with with that trail system that you have. Perfect. So follow up to that. Love the examples of utilizing adaptive mountain bike. I had no idea this was a thing. Any supplier recommendations? Yeah, so there are a few different companies. We're actually really lucky that the best mountain bike on the market right now is made in Calgary. And uh, it's called uh, Bowhead Corp. Uh, I represent them. And the it's wonderful that it's available, but the difficulty is the expense and the top of the line mountain well really you can't really find an entry level mountain bike it's pretty much they're just you know pretty standard so an entry level mountain bike would start at fifteen thousand dollars top of the line would be at twenty five thousand dollars um so uh, it's a huge barrier um something that i recognize and so that's why i i founded the mountain bike club is so that people within Saskatchewan have access to equipment. They don't have to go purchase their own and they can borrow or rent uh, the equipment. Uh, I, it's just a volunteer thing where I, I set the equipment up for them. Once they're familiar with it, they can take it out uh, on their own. And uh, just, I asked for a donation back for maintenance of the equipment. So uh, the, the technology has improved greatly even in the last five years. Uh, but there's also other equipment out there like off-road wheelchairs uh, called like the Grit Freedom Wheelchair. And um, so I'm hoping I'm I have this big goal of partnering with somebody like SAS Parks or something to have equipment like that available, too, so that people don't have to have that huge financial burden of purchasing something that they might only use two or three times a year 
but still have it available for them. Perfect. Another one. Hi, Lisa. Have you done disc golfing? I actually have. Yes, I've done it a few times and it's uh, entirely possible. Uh, but uh, again, it's sort of a meeting again of the natural environment and the equipment that is available. So I actually have an attachment that goes on my wheelchair. Um, I wish I had a picture of it, but it is the front of a bicycle that's electric. So it actually would attach to my wheelchair and then uh, it's like I have handlebars and everything and it can pull me through that grass or over that firm trail that would be a, a little hard on my wheelchair. And so that is how I chose to get around the, the courses that I've done. Uh, wheeling with just a wheelchair would be pretty challenging and just getting through grass or rougher terrain uh, would be a very slow process, but I have uh, uh, found ways around it with the attachments that I have.